Real Stories Tapes True Crime is your new true crime podcast fix. In our first season, we'll explore suspicious deaths at a California hospital and a skydiver landing dead on a suburban driveway with a bag containing guns, drugs, and night vision goggles. To join our investigation, search and subscribe to Real Stories Tapes True Crime on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you find your podcasts. King of the armed robbers in Australia. Because you can't do an armed robbery of a bank in Australia these days. You can't jump a counter anymore. Armed robbers talk about the addictive quality of armed robbery. Describe it as, as a drug-like experience, rush. They're most probably two of the best armed robbers and best planners of armed robberies that uh, we've seen for a long time. This is the story of Russell Mad Dog Cox, Australia's most famous fugitive. And Ray Chuck Bennett, the mastermind behind Australia's biggest heist. They were ruthless armed robbers who wouldn't hesitate to kill. Both men were feared and admired by their peers and police for their courage to do what other criminals would not. In this episode of Suburban Gangsters, we explore the life and crimes of armed robbers Russell Cox and Ray Bennett. The police called Cox Mad Dog because he'd shoot at anyone who disturbed him during a heist. But fellow crims knew him as the Fox after he escaped from a maximum security prison. He evaded police for 11 years. Bennett escaped from an English prison, returned home, and then pulled off the greatest stick-up in Australian history, worth an estimated $90 million in today's money. Ray Bennett feared no one, but met his match in Brian Murphy, one of Melbourne's toughest cops of the day, and the two men became mortal enemies. That day I interviewed him, he said to me at the time, when, when I was going through the interview, he said, I'm going to tell you something. He said, at my time, at the time of my making, in the place where I want to, I'm going to blow your fucking head off. You're nothing but a cunt, and that's it. I said, well, fair enough. I said, it's started now. He said, no, it'll be when I'm fucking ready. Raymond Patrick Bennett was born into a poor family in Chilton, country Victoria, in 1949. He was a kid that uh, wasn't sure where his next meal would come from. His family and he would be kicked out of home and they would effectively be homeless for a short period of time. That's uh, a husband, a wife and three children uh, living on the streets for a day or so. Ray's uncle, who was a painter and docker, would give them some money to get them back on their feet. The Painters and Dockers Union was the gateway to crime in Melbourne. Many of the membership were honest workers, but the union also welcomed crooks into its ranks. Hard men whose trades were extortion, robbery and murder. Since World War II, it got more and more corrupt. Part of the reason it got more corrupt was that Pentridge uh, released prisoners 
people that got out of Pentridge couldn't find a job anywhere else, but they could always find one on the docks. They would employ ex -crims. No other institution in Australia would employ ex -crims. So they were known as people who were being prepared to sort of hire someone who had been in jail before. Your record didn't work against you. So therefore they, they had this incredible reputation of being almost a criminal organisation. In 1963, naive and fresh from the country, Ray Bennett got a job on the docks through his uncle. He became a painter and docker at 14, and he was moving around with some of the most significant criminals in Melbourne at the time. He was watching them and learning from them. Any 14-year-old boy who's exposed to the world of adulthood is going to take on, in the early days, the norms of that environment he's in. Being in the Painters and Dockers Union at that age would have been very strongly influenced by the environment of being in a group of adults who could do what they wanted to, take what they wanted, and smuggle whole containers off the docks. As the new kid on the dock, it was Bennett's job to punch the work tickets of senior union members so they'd get paid for work they didn't do. It was part of an elaborate Dockers scam called ghosting. Ghosting in waterfront language means collecting pay packets for men who haven't worked. According to the bulletin, there are twice as many pay packets as painters and dockers. By age 19, Bennett had amassed convictions for stealing, housebreaking, receiving stolen goods and safe breaking. In his own way, he was the mastermind criminal. He was frightened of nothing. He uh, knew more than uh, the old blokes that had schooled him. And as far as he was concerned, he was number one. And uh, a lot of blokes that worked for him, worked with him and admired him, believed that he was. Age 20, Bennett met the love of his life, Gail Petrie. Young and madly in love, Gail had no idea of Ray's criminal history. When a woman marries a man who is a serious criminal, it's often the way that they would prefer not to know. In Gail's circumstance, it only became known to her after they married. So there's love there and there's this very strong bond. She's not going to judge her husband for what, she, for what he does from that point. Well, he started taking on, you know, banks and 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 uh, armoured cars and, and safes and all this kind of stuff. So he was he was he wasn't he wasn't frightened to point a gun at somebody. He wasn't frightened to kill. He wasn't frightened to police. Ignorance may well have been bliss for Gail Petrie, especially after the money came rolling in. When violence broke out amongst the painters and dockers, Ray Bennett decided to try his luck in England. He was introduced to the Kangaroo Gang, a group of Australian thieves working in London. They were masters of distraction and cleaned out luxury stores in broad daylight. But Bennett was never a shoplifter. Ray Chuck Bennett was an armed robber. Shoplifting is a kind of whole different scenario. It's not about violence, not about guns. He was robbing houses with a guy called Brian O'Callaghan, who was in fact a, a, a sort of member of the kangaroo gang. But, uh, but they, were, they were caught and they served some time on the Isle of Wight. And uh, again, Brian Murphy tells a story that he was relayed from the English coppers where uh, Bennett was in a, in a jail cell with another guy um, who was in there for a petty crime, only there for a couple of days. Uh, the, the jailer comes in to, to, to get this guy out. It's time for him to leave. Uh, Bennett said to this guy, I'm taking your identity and you'll say nothing about it. So this bloke, Billy Bloggs, whatever his name was, Bennett walks free and he was gone. When he arrived back into Australia's criminal underworld, he was no longer a rookie. As soon as the people who he used to look up to regard him as being almost an equal, as soon as they start deferring to him, asking for his advice and his information, he would have seen himself as being on the same footing as them. It's not about the apprentice becoming the master, it's about other masters recognising the apprentice as having graduated to their level. 
It would not be long before Bennett pulled off the impossible, a heist that would become known as the Great Bookie Robbery. The only man ever to escape from the supermax security prison Katingal was born Melville Peter Schnitzeling in Brisbane in 1949. He was a man of many names. His family called him Timmy, and when he became a career criminal, he changed his name to Russell Cox. He was highly intelligent, but that intellect was used on crime from an early age. Like most professional criminals, Cox comes from a background of juvenile crime. Mark Reed tells a story which may well be apocryphal that Cox's life of crime began when he was about 10 when he'd run, won a raffle, the prize for which was a bicycle. Cox had not been present for the draw of this raffle and had therefore been denied the prize and in some sort of misguided retaliation had um, stolen himself a bicycle. Certainly court records show that Cox was before Asheville Children's Court, age 11, for stealing three bicycles. Schnitzeling came to notice for his losses, not his wins, with convictions for assault and car theft. Like Bennett, he had an appetite for risk, but he was impetuous and defiant. A year later, he was committed to an institution until he was 18. He has spent the majority of his childhood in boys' homes. Inside the boys' home, Cox developed his violent nature. I suspect that Russell Cox was brutalised, was punished. I suspect he had a very difficult, rather challenging childhood, and he defended himself with the means he had at his disposal. I suspect he dealt with a system that was unforgiving towards him, and I felt he, he probably defended himself with those skills that he had. He graduated from boys' homes to jail, doing his first three-month stretch at the age of 18. He was still a petty crook, but he was getting hooked on the thrill that crime brought. Personalities of people who get involved in crime quite often what they are is we call them sensation-seeking or risk-taking. They have low levels of natural arousal and what they need is something that's going to give them a buzz. So crime, particularly crime that's risky, crime that's dangerous, a crime that also has good or big payoffs, tends to be you know, quite buzzy. It, it does, it raises the adrenaline, and to that end, it meets the psychological need that they've got, which is to be sensation-seeking, to be risk-taking. So it happens that those needs are much more strong when a person's young. At the age of 24, he received a four-year jail sentence for break and entering. To this point, Melville Peter Timmy Schnitzeling was a failure as a crook. But in jail, his education rapidly progressed. He emerged from prison with a new name, Russell Cox, and a new trade, armed robbery. They were probably two of the best armed robbers and best planners of armed robberies that we've seen for a long time. The 1970s was a time of success and prosperity in Australia. Crooks like Cox and Bennett competed to find ways to steal it. In the 60s and 70s, we were at a zenith for armed robbery. I think the 70s was the biggest armed robbery decade in the whole of Australia. Bennett's heist in 1976 topped the lot for its ingenuity and audacity. Tonight, an Australia-wide hunt is continuing for the Victoria Club bandits, so far without success. Official estimates still put the haul at one and a half million dollars, but there are many in Melbourne who now say the figure could be as high as five million. The Great Bookie Robbery was the culmination of months of meticulous planning and physical training. Ray Bennett, with a team of five others, 
attacked the Victorian Club in downtown Melbourne and relieved bookies of their Easter weekend takings. A haul later estimated at $15 million or $90 million in today's money. Ray Bennett uh, assembled uh, a core of very experienced armed robbers, uh, most of them from Victoria. The only person missing from that group that had greater credentials as an armed robber was Russell Cox. Now, Russell Cox may have been in Victoria at the time of the Great Bookie robbery, but my understanding is that he was not involved in it. Other gangs had wanted to rob the bookies, but it had been largely dismissed as impossible. It took the criminal mastermind Ray Bennett to choreograph such a complex heist. The idea was to secure the premises. No one gets in, no one gets out. The great bookie robbery itself would be over in minutes, but the planning involved not just getting in, but also how to get out without attracting a lot of attention. It involved a military-style fitness regime, visits to the club to tamper with the lift to reduce suspicion when it was out of order during the heist. And they filed down the bolts on the doors to the fire escape so that it could easily be kicked in. On the day of the robbery, uh, the men waited, balaclavered, for the armoured van to arrive with all the bookie bags containing cash. When the bags arrived on the second floor, the robbers burst through the door. The Only two of them spoke. Of the two men that spoke, one was Ray. The other man said, get down, everybody get down. One of the men left the second floor and secured the front door of the building. He controlled the stairs from there. Once they had the cash, they actually took it upstairs to an office that they had leased. They didn't go back for it and get their money for a month. From that point, they simply walked out through the front door. And all six men joined up later that day for lunch in a pub in South Melbourne to celebrate their success. While Bennett was laying low after pulling off the biggest heist in Australian history, Russell Cox was planning an ingenious escape from Katingle, the supermax wing of Long Bay Jail. He'd originally been sentenced to 12 years for armed robbery, but during a failed escape attempt, he'd nearly killed a prison officer. So Cox was transferred to Katingle. Cox, being such a high security risk after the hostage taking of the prison officer, was domiciled in Katingle, which was the, uh, the high security wing for the state's most dangerous criminals. Katingle had a method by which it was not just solitary confinement, but where even your meals would be given to you on a mechanised plate. You would have no contact even with your prison waters. The King Hall was a very debilitating place. It was virtually a concrete blockhouse, a place that I would never have thought anyone could possibly escape from. Russell Cox is the first prisoner ever to escape from Katingle, the new maximum security section here at Long Bay Jail. He's also regarded by police as potentially the most dangerous prisoner ever to escape. Cox was a fitness fanatic. He used to regularly train in the backyard of the, or the exercise yard of the jail. And part of his training regime was to do pull-ups on the overhead bars. Ron Woodham was working at Long Bay as a guard at the time. Russell Cox smuggled a small piece of hacksaw blade in in a belt when he was out on escort. At court, he was given the belt and he swapped belts. He'd climb up the the grill work there and do chin-ups on the bars on the roof. Just take the blade out for a, a couple of saw cuts every day, put it back and just, just exercise. You've got to give him credit because he was able to climb up, hang on by one arm, saw with the other, 
to do a little bit of soaring each day. When he finally got that bar cut for he was able to escape. Once onto the roof, um, Cox is scarpered over that, jumps over the edge of the concrete bunker, runs a short distance to a wire fence, scales that, runs another short distance, scales another fence, and then he's had a couple of hundred metres to run to the brick perimeter wall around Long Bay over that, and then he's off. Getting out of Katingal would have been in itself a once-in-a-lifetime incident. It would be like becoming the best neurosurgeon in the world for a short period of time. Because Katingal had the reputation of being unescapable. Him escaping from Katingal embarrassed a great many people. It embarrassed the system. Police expected to have Cox back in custody within days. But six months later, he was still at large. They certainly didn't expect his next move. Perhaps as extraordinary as Cox's escape from Katingal is that six months after he broke out, he broke back in. A fellow by the name of Edward James Smith, better known as Jockey Smith, was also convicted and he was domiciled in Katingal. And because Cox and Jockey Smith had such a, a long association, Cox was in fact disturbed trying to break back into Katingal to spring the escape of Smith, but he was disturbed and again successfully ran away. Now for a criminal justice system that, that prides itself on keeping the worst of the worst in jail indefinitely, his escape would have held him up to be the ultimate target. I think he stands alone in many of his peers for that particular challenging success. And to go back and take someone else out is to rub his, their nose, the criminal justice, the police, the corrections officers, their nose in it a second time. And that may well have been more of a buzz for Russell Cox than anything else. His jailbreak attempt may have failed, but Cox would remain Australia's most wanted man for another decade. In 1976, Ray Bennett, one of Australia's best armed robbers, pulled off the great bookie robbery, worth an estimated $90 million in today's money. I imagine part of him is thinking, I've done a pretty good day's work today. It was a bigger haul than we thought it was going to be, and therefore it was very successful. The other part of him is thinking, um, well, now I've put my hand up as being the biggest person around today, there are going to be plenty of people coming to chop me. Any part of that amount of money would have been an attractive bait for anyone because once he'd obtained the money, it would have been easier for them to steal it from him than to steal it from the original source of where the funds were stored. The huge prize was expected to attract the attention of the infamous Toe Cutter Gang. They were renowned for persuading armed robbers to hand over their loot, sometimes by lopping off toes or applying a blowtorch. Now, they were a rough bunch of guys linked to the IRA, but they looked at Ray Bennett and his gang in Melbourne and they decided that that was a war they would rather not fight. So the toe cutters stayed away and to the degree that Ray Bennett was extorted or had money extorted from him rests essentially with Les and Brian Kane. The Kane brothers were members of the Painters and Dockers Union and had ferocious reputations. The two of them would always front up, collect money, and they used to show a lot of violence. And they'd jump all over your head, you know, to, to collect three or four uh, hundred dollars, you know, and uh, they used to break your legs and break your arms, and lots of stuff, and put holes in you. And they were very violent people. There was a lot of money splashed around, and you see, this is what irked the Canes. They, they wanted a bit of the pie, and... Uh, they were going to try and use the tactics that the toe cutters in Sydney used, but they didn't have the dash. The bad blood began in a suburban hotel. During a brawl, a Bennett gang member bit off part of Brian Kane's ear. In retaliation, Les Kane declared war and threatened Bennett's family. There were a number of rules being broken at the time. The main rule is that you don't involve families. 
But when Les Kane had threatened Ray Bennett's family, Ray Bennett thought, well, OK, the gloves are off. Bennett decided a preemptive surprise attack on Les Kane would solve his problems. Police say Leslie Kane, a former painter and docker, was murdered in his Juan Turner home, but his body was never found. Three men were charged with Leslie Kane's murder, Lawrence Prendergast, Vincent Mickelson, and this man, Raymond Chuck Bennett. There are a couple of different versions of this. That the gang had actually infiltrated into Kane's house. They had watched Les Kane come in. They watched him as he put his gun in the medicine cabinet, ready to have a shower or something. They leapt out, grabbed him, shot him with several automatic weapons. His wife and kids were on hand at the time. The gang bundled his body into the back of his own Ford and Les nor the car were ever seen again. The fact that they did it in front of his wife and kids was, uh, you just couldn't forgive that kind of thing. From that time on, villains' houses weren't safe, nor were anybody else's houses. Killing Kane in front of his family would have dotted the I's and crossed the T's. It means that I'm not afraid to butcher you in front of your loved ones. It was an execution, and it was a public execution. There's nothing more public than doing it in front of someone's family. Crossing that line sent a clear message to the underworld to stay away. The message was well and truly received. The loot was safe, but for Bennett, it wasn't enough. There are some blokes today won't do a, an armed robbery under a million dollars. But uh, he, I think, was a part of his way of life. And um, the more he did, the more power he got on the docks. Uh, a lot of blokes, a lot of the old times were terrified of him. One of the toughest detectives of his generation, Brian Murphy, said that uh, Ray Chuck Bennett was the only one he actually feared. Brian Murphy first met Ray Bennett in the late 70s when he was sent to search Bennett's home for stolen goods. When police arrived, only his wife, Gail, and son were at home. Gail alleged that during the search, Murphy picked up her son and threw him onto a bed. She was on one side of the bed and I've walked to the end of the bed and diagonally, if you cut the corner off at a 45 degree angle, I passed the baby over to a little fellow, he's about three, I think, and uh, everything was all right. And um, because she started, she was, once she was upset, she was in full flight, so I got out. And that was the last of it until later that evening, uh, then another bloke uh, visited us where, uh, at the corner of uh, the, uh, the Victoria Pizza Parlour. Bennett believed Murphy had used unnecessary force with his son. As far as he was concerned, Murphy had to go. In November 1977, Russell Mad Dog Cox did the impossible and escaped from Katingle, the supermax wing of Long Bay Jail. It was expected he would be recaptured within hours of his escape, but a year later, he was still on the run. Cox is a master of disguise and can alter his appearance at will. He's known to have studied theatrical makeup and can use wigs and glasses to hide his true physicality. Almost all prison escapees are recaptured. But 40 years ago, without the benefit of facial recognition software or CCTV, the police relied on reported sightings. If you take any of the known pictures of Cox, there's nothing particularly physically striking about him to start with. He's also been able to change that fairly ordinary appearance, sometimes just with basic things like spectacles, different haircuts, different facial hair, seem to dramatically change his appearance. Hiding in plain sight allowed Cox to live a relatively normal life and to fall in love with Ray Bennett's sister-in-law, Helen Dean. She was a respectable nurse who knew nothing of Cox's criminal endeavours. 
When she found out, she decided to stay with him and embraced a life on the run. Despite being wanted by the police in at least three states, Cox has described his life on the run as being relatively normal. He's in a stable relationship. He's in some time employment. He's also robbing banks. He's probably on the dole. It was only those times when he was conscious of police being in the street, thought he was perhaps being followed, that he was um, brought back to the reality that he was a, a fugitive. For five years, Cox had managed to stay off the police radar. But in 1981, he was implicated in a hit on a payroll van carrying $327,000 in cash. It wasn't long before New South Wales police received a credible lead. Roger Rogerson is now a convicted murderer, but then he was part of a crew of detectives on Cox's trail. The closest we got to getting him was uh, some time later, some years later, up near Mwoolumba, and uh, we'd received information that he was uh, on a farm there. And uh, I took a team of guys up there, including some very smart uh, surveillance guys, and uh, we were quite satisfied that he was at this particular property. We liaised with the local police over that night and uh, the next morning. Now, whether someone amongst those other police officers said something stupidly and someone picked it up in the town, by the time he got out of that farm, he was no longer there. Cox and Dean escaped to the quiet suburb of Mount Martha in Melbourne's southeast. January 1983, Cox turns up at Mount Martha, a house occupied by Ian Carroll, former uh, great bookie robber and a uh, very serious crim. Dean's brother-in-law, Ray Bennett, had introduced them years earlier. For a while, the two wanted armed robbers lived under the same roof, but eventually they turned their guns on each other. Russell Cox made headlines in 1977 by becoming the only man ever to escape from the supposedly escape-proof Katingal High Security Unit at Long Bay Jail. He's wanted for questioning about the murder in January of Melbourne painter and docker Ian Carroll at this house in Mount Martha on the Mornington Peninsula. A large cache of weapons was found at the house, one of the biggest illegal gun hauls ever made in Victoria. During the gunfight, Cox had been shot in the thigh, but he and Dean were long gone when police arrived. Helen Dean was a trained nurse and was apparently able to go above and beyond those skills, removing the bullet in Cox's leg, providing him with all of the, the treatment he, he needed. Um, apparently he was up and literally running the next day. But Cox's charmed life on the run was about to come to an end. Ray Bennett was a criminal mastermind who was feared and admired by police for his courage and dash. But he met his match in detective Brian Murphy. And as far as he was concerned, Murphy had to go. It's an interesting point, the one you raised before, that there's a similarity between police officers and, and criminals. That's right. How are police and someone like Ray Bennett similar? Lots of good people might say that they're, they're nothing like each other. I believe they are. In a lot of ways, uh, they take risks, and the policeman takes just as many risks. Uh, he's got to take up a position where, no matter how bad they are, they'll never get over the top of him. Ray Bennett was the only criminal to test Murphy's nerve to the limit. Bennett believed Murphy had hurt his son during a police raid on his home, and for that, Murphy would die. That Friday night, myself and several other detectives went over to have a pizza at West Melbourne. We were met by uh, Bennett and another friend of his, who was well known to me, 
and uh, Ben had opened the conversation and he was still throwing uh, little babies across bedrooms. And uh, I said, I don't know what you're talking about. He said, you fucking do know what I'm talking about. I said, well, if you think that, you can get fucked because I haven't done it. One word led to another and uh, he and his mate took off. I said to my mate, have you got your gun on you? He said, no. I said, well, I haven't got mine. You go back and get it. And I don't, I just had a bad feeling about it. He hopped in the car and brought our guns back. I said, listen, if they throw a grenade or an explosive through that bloody window, we're all gone. I said, I'm not sitting in here. So I went outside. I was standing at the front and he pulled up with another guy and they flipped the boot open and Chuck produced a pump action shotgun. Well, as that took place, there's a half a dozen fellows walked around from the market and came into the pizza parlour, which buggered up his view. You could see he was furious. He knew that too many witnesses there. And uh, he slammed the boot of the car down and they took off. That precipitated a huge feud between you two. See, it did. It started a, uh, a war between he and I of his making. Um, I um, believe that hatred of the police and and hatred that he'd been um, not outsmarted, but he, he, he wasn't able to accomplish what he wanted to do on that night. Two days later, Bennett and his wife were brought in for questioning over the incident. When officers left the room, Bennett was overheard asking his wife to destroy evidence. When they're in the interview room, he asked her, have you still got the receipt for that shotgun that he bought? in fact, to kill me. Uh, he could have picked up, uh, he would have had shotguns and everything, but it was part of the bloke's makeup. He had to have a special gun to kill me for what I'd done to his kid. And um, he, uh, she said, no, I got him a bra. He said, well, you tell him what you want to go to the toilet. When you go to the toilet, flush it away, well, cause he was on tape. And, and so they recovered that uh, um, receipt, which made me feel a lot better. In what would be the last time the two men would speak, the skull took the chair opposite his adversary. There were other policemen around, but I was to interview him. The conversation was that he was uh, hitting of the stuff. One way or another, he would kill me. He would do it himself. And he'd, uh, I'd never get over the top of him. And I said, well, <laughs> i got the same feeling about you. I said, if I get in first, you'd have had it. I said, but if you want to sort it out here and uh, here and now and sort out what took place on that Friday, last Friday, in relation to your wife and your child, I said, uh, we can do it here. He said, no, what you did is wrong. He said, and I'm going to fucking kill you. Murphy wasn't the only policeman who wanted Bennett behind bars. He was still a key suspect in the murder of Les Kane. Ray Bennett and two other men were charged with the murder of Les Kane. All three were acquitted at trial. Uh, the other two men went into hiding. They were released onto the streets. But Ray Bennett had an outstanding matter, an armed payroll, and he was remanded. Yeah, he was in H Division, and the Canes had all their people down there plotting and planning to stick knives at him in H Division. And that's why he was. That's why he was pleased that I went in the yard with him. Because if, if I went in the yard with him, you're as sweet as a bun. I ran Hayes Division. Let's not let's not um, beat around the bush. I ran. I ran Hayes Division. Bennett would have been prepared for retribution within prison walls, but not in a courthouse. Raymond Patrick Bennett was gunned down in the corridors of the courthouse as he was being led to the 10th court to face armed robbery charges. The killer stood at the top of a flight of stairs and fired three shots, hitting Bennett twice in the chest and in one of his hands. As the killer calmly turned and went down the back stairs of the court, Bennett reeled backwards and ran into a courtyard where he collapsed in a pool of blood. The police officers escorting him, after being warned by the killer not to follow, chased Bennett, believing he was trying to escape. You were in the frame? Yeah. After Ray Bennett was shot? That's right. 
Talk me through what happened after Ray Bennett was shot dead. That morning, that morning uh, we were, uh, myself and another member, we've driven up to the entrance of the uh, police garage. One of the blokes said, oh, your mate's just been knocked. I said, who? He said, Chuck. I said, you're joking. He said, no. I said, when? He said, oh, about five minutes ago. So I said, fair enough. I got to the front door of the court and there was an inspector there and, uh, and of course I had my police pass there and I said, oh, I want to come in. He said, no, you keep away and go away. You're not wanted here, all right? Now there are allegations that the killer was in fact a police officer. I was told about those allegations by high ranking police officers. I was also told that the police internal investigation squad, B11, is conducting investigations into two police officers in connection with the Bennett slaying. The allegation of a policeman being the shooter was dropped and the real identity of the killer was revealed. There is no doubt that Brian Kane murdered Ray Bennett. There is speculation that Brian Kane received assistance from corrupt police uh, in order to leave the scene as quickly as he did and not be captured, but we'll never really know about that. What we do know is that Brian Kane shot Ray Bennett because Ray Bennett had shot and killed Brian Kane's brother, Les. It was a quid pro quo. Ray Bennett, Australia's great criminal mastermind, was dead at 32. In a final irony, Brian Murphy was sent to guard the body of his now deceased rival. The police department gave uh, my squad the job of uh, guarding the body down at the undertakers because they reckoned that the canes were going to again chop his hands and feet off and both them with his wife. And I was looking at him, I thought, well, what a waste of a uh, life. Uh, here you are, the age you are, and uh, your wife and kids left behind. Yeah, what was it all worth? You know, and, uh, hmm. Russell Cox and his partner, Helen Dean, mourned the loss of their brother-in-law. Bennett's death would not go unpunished. Two armed men wearing balaclavas entered the Quarry Hotel and shot painter and docker Brian Kane twice, once in the head and chest. He was rushed to hospital but died shortly afterwards. The chief suspect, although never charged, was Russell Cox. Despite being wanted in three states for armed robbery and possible homicide, Cox managed to stay at large for a further six years. His luck ran out in 1988 on a job he'd planned with another fugitive, Ray Denning. Cox rendezvoused with Denning at the Doncaster shopping centre. Security guards there noticed something suspicious, contacted the police. The two prize catchers, criminals Cox and Denning, were taken into custody just before two o'clock this afternoon. Police had responded to a tip that people wearing balaclavas had been seen in two cars that were following an armoured cash delivery van. They intercepted Denning's car and found two sawn-off .22 rifles and balaclavas. But Cox, after seeing the police, tried to escape through the car park. A policeman armed with a shotgun fired three shots at Cox's car, shattering the windscreen and hitting the door and boot. Cox then lost control of the car, colliding with a brick wall. It was only after Cox was taken to CIB headquarters that police realised the significance of the arrest. The armed robbery squad turned up, realised that Denning was in the car park, but initially had no idea that they also had a far bigger fish. One can imagine the excitement this was Australia's most wanted man. There's really no doubt about that. Cox was charged with a series of armed robberies, but he was acquitted for the murder of Ian Carroll, as it could not be proved who fired the first shot. Cox received a sentence of 29 years and four months. 
from Cox's arrest in 1988 until his eventual parole, he appears to have been the classic model prisoner. He's decided that he's going to have to do this time. In 2004, the parole board granted Cox an early release. Before Cox left prison, he said that he wanted to live a quiet life, that his days of criminality were well and truly behind him. There's plenty of evidence to suggest that that is indeed what he intended and, and intends to do. Since his release, Russell Cox has stayed on the police radar, but seems to be living a quiet life with his partner, Helen Dean. <laughs> 